Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who haven't introduced myself to it yet, my name is Peter Davis. I'm the Recreate Program Manager. As you've heard from Cheryl earlier, Recreate is the, the EU Interreg Program, which is funding the festival, the Street Theatre Festival, the Fashion Festival, the Sorting Office, the Tech Hub, and a lot of other activity in East Sleep. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Lisa James Larson, who I've known far too long, and who is the superb director, um, Alejandro Delita. I'm here to talk to you about film directing and television directing, but rather than talking at you for an hour, I'd love to talk with you. I want this to be a bit interactive, otherwise it's just going to be me babbling and you trying to stay away, perhaps. So can you all see me and hear me if you can't do wrap it around, keep it intimate, that's the way I like it. You don't look like students, you're not students, you're people who already work in film or people who are passionate about film or who are you? <laughs> Why are you here? You want to hear me talk about film directing just from my absolute subjective perspective because that's all I can give you. Yeah. All I can give you is my experiences as a film director and there'll be strong opinions and they will not be held by everyone. There's no right and there's no wrong but I can talk to you about what I do and how I come to do it. That's interesting. Um, my name is Lisa James Larson. I live in Stockholm, Sweden. I moved there in 2005 because I got into the National Film School there. Having already completed a degree at the age of 20, like you do, at uh, Brunel University in Richmond, where I studied film and television studies. I came out with that degree not really knowing quite what I wanted to do, other than that I had a good laugh and gotten into an enormous amount of debt for three years. Um, and glided into a job as a freelance camera operator and editor. And my first full-time job was in the screen acting department of a drama school in London. Um, they were one of the first drama schools to have a screen acting department that, that understood that when you're teaching actors it's really handy to share the discipline of acting for the stage, for the screen as well as the stage. Not all drama schools did that, but Art said did and do that. They had a, a guy called Michael Ferguson running their screen department when I worked there and he was an old BBC producer and director, he'd done like loads of episodes of Bill and produced and even nominated for BAFTAs and things like that. And um, in his later years, he'd dedicated himself to, to sharing everything that he knew about screen acting for actors. So with rather small budgets, they were able to offer the actors the opportunity to crew for themselves and above all act in, in short films, which they could then use after they graduated from drama school to try and get themselves agents and to get screen acting work. Um, and my job there was to film them with a little early HD camera, in the year 2000, with little tapes in it, and to then edit these short films into little pieces that they could use and the screenings regularly. So I made, I guess, about 20 films a year like that on these really low budgets. And I think that the more I did that, the more I learned about what, how to tell a story and filmmaking, and the more I realized that it was something I wanted to do. I wanted to control not just the way that it was shot and the way that it was cut, but I wanted to tell my stories. I think that probably, in retrospect, I've been a director since I was three or four years old. It's just been in me. Directing is a funny thing because unlike being a camera operator where you have your camera or being an editor where you have your edit suites, you have nothing when you're a director. You just have your ability to communicate a vision and to sell an idea um, with all the passion that you have in your whole life, really. And if anything, I suppose I came from an acting perspective. Lots of DOP, uh, lots of directors come from a really visual background, and they've perhaps been photographers before. 
but I came from, my father's an acting teacher, so I came from a love of acting and a love of performance. Not really so much theatre, because theatre for me always felt so far away. I wanted to sit on the lap, lap of the actor and really see it close up. You know, I fell in love with the close up. What's happening? What can a close up on a, on a human being's eyes tell you about what it is to be human? And ever since I was a tiny, tiny child, my dad reminds me that I used to watch The Wizard of Oz when I was little and pause it frame by frame by frame on the bit where the door opens and it goes to Technicolor, you know, from black and white to Technicolor. So I've always been fascinated with storytelling and with the visual. So when Michael, the head of the acting department, said to me, what do you think, Lisa? Do you want to write and direct one of these yourself? I, it was like someone switched the light on for me. I mean, I'd had my degree and I'd had three, four years of making films and being involved and being around actors at such a young age. But when he said that, it was just like an epiphany. I was 24 and the answer was just with all my heart, yes, I want to. Even if I have a teeny tiny budget and then turns up with three names on the credits and mine comes up again and again. Filmed, edited, written and directed by Lisa James Larson. I wanted to do that, so I set about writing didn't know it right, didn't know it was a thing that you could really fail at all. I, I suppose that's good really, so I didn't then put the pressure on myself that it had to be good. Now I'm going to write something and it must be good. So I suppose I didn't have that self-critical thing and I was in a drama school where people were handing around parts of themselves all the time. Every time they stand on a the stage they're giving of themselves. So for me it didn't feel like an enormous pressure to say, yeah, I wrote this, can we make this? And you know, wait for the rejection. I think a lot of writers can be paralysed by the idea that what they're writing isn't really good enough, and you're so critical of yourself that you never really dare to either completely paralyse yourself and can't even get it onto the page, or you can't show it to anyone once it's written. But naive as it was, and that's kind of a blessing, naivety, I wrote and directed and filmed and edited a little film called Carry Me, in 2003, and I absolutely loved it, and the accomplishment that I felt afterwards is awful. I mean, God, I wouldn't show a clip from that now. It's, in retrospect, 11 years later, absolutely horrifyingly pretentious, but it had its moments, and it, it meant that I had something that I could then apply to film school with, because without that, I wouldn't, I mean, without that and the other subsequent short films I made, at that drama school, I wouldn't have been able to get into the National Film School in Sweden. Because it, just, because it was such an amazing experience, it became very, very clear to me that that's what I needed to do. I was offered a job as an editor at Sky, but I turned it down because I went to the interview or the show around. I'd actually been offered a job, and I saw that the editors had put on the wall a, a homemade poster that said, how miserable are you today on the scale from really, really miserable to just averagely miserable. And the air conditioning gave me claustrophobia and the windows were really small. I thought, okay, I could get 60 grand a year to sit here and edit crap daytime TV for Sky. Or I could stay on one third of the wage and do another year in my little drama school where I could make more films and use those films to just go and be a student again at the age of 27. And I did choose that, and it was a hard, it sounds like it wouldn't be a hard choice, but it was quite a hard choice, because I lived in London, had a boyfriend, had a flat, had worked for five years, and could have been an editor. But I thought, no, I threw caution to the wind, continued to make short films, and applied for the film school. And that is like sliding doors moment. I went, I applied for a film school, but I made right. They take four students every two years, and between 800 and 1,000 people apply for the directing course, and it's like X Factor. You go over for another interview, you fly over to Sweden, you have another interview. And each one of those interviews for this particular film school wasn't an exercise in selling yourself, it was an exercise in telling stories. So I simultaneously applied for the National Film School here, which I know is amazing and prestigious and incredible. But when the application came through, it also came with a price list. It's going to cost you 12 grand a year, you don't get any budget, you have to make your own budget for your films. Why do you think you deserve to go to the film school? What do you have as a director that's so special? And my film school in, uh, in Stockholm said, look at this picture, what do you see? What story do you want to tell that's to do with this woman's face? And I just thought, 
well, obviously, I don't, I, it was also free. So obviously, I wanted to go to the free one that has a creative background and also learn a new language, which happens to be my mum's language. So there was that. But the day came and the letter came through. Yes, your life is going to change. Come to Sweden for three years and go to this incredible film school. So in 2005, my life completely changed and off I flew with my life pack. And at the age of 27, with already 12 grand of debt for my first degree, I went and did another degree, followed by an MA, which means that I'm now qualified seven years in, in directing and writing. So basically, if I'd gone up medical route, I'd be a brain surgeon by now. <laughs> but when you go to film school, obviously you come out, and again, you've got this intangible nothingness. You're a film director who has a couple of film school films, which again are what you do when you are trying to learn who you are. So you make all your mistakes at film school, and they encourage that. You make films that are imitating Amelie from Montmartre, even if you're more Mike Lee in your head. Or you, you tell a story with somebody you hated and didn't get on with at all writing a script, but, and it comes out like an absolute disaster, but you, you find your way and you become well, it'll be three years of anyone's life, you become more the person that you're becoming, don't you? So I suppose for me, film school was just incredibly experimental, safe, naive, and challenging and fun. But then you come out, and then you're expected to earn a living doing that and that what. I don't I'm still trying to find the words to explain what film director does, really. I think it would have been harder for me if I didn't have the writing, if I hadn't done an MA in screenwriting and had the sheer, what the hell is it, perseverance, uh, energy to write, sit and write my own script. I'd probably still be sitting now, five years later, waiting for someone to put a script in my hands that I wanted to make. Because it's a good script, a really good script that you feel with enough passion to be able to see it all the way through to the very end. It probably doesn't come around more than a couple of times in a lifetime, I would say. I've been offered to read tons of scripts over the last four years, particularly since my film, my feature came out, that are just like almost unreadable. And that's somebody's work that they probably spent three years passionately wanting, but it's so personal when you when you're a director and you choose a piece that you need to and it's so, so strongly, otherwise it just isn't going to get funded. It's too hard to get your films made, to just say yes to everything and think you can bust your way through getting it financed and bust your way through doing it. It doesn't work. It's only now that I've made a feature and I'm starting to work on it. It's only now that I'm able to see the difference between my project, my baby, my films, the ones I write or the ones that I read and just touch turning on in every single way conceivable. And jobs where, here you go, this is your job for the year. You're going to do three episodes of a fine series that's got rape women and dead children, but you're going to do it really fucking well. And it's someone else's words, and you can't mess around with that. And this is the cast, and you didn't choose them. And, I, and you need to do that too if you want to actually earn a living. Otherwise, okay, integrity, marvellous, but I'm going to have to work in Sainsbury's in the weekends in order to afford my mortgage. So you have to, there's a real, there's a difference, and you have to obviously in the job job, the MOOC jobs, you have to find something there that's going to make you a good director. Otherwise, everyone's going to see through it, and it's just going to be shit work. Nobody wants to have their name on shit work. So right now in my career, I find myself in luxurious position of being offered jobs that I then choose. Scary if you can say it turn down because they don't get me going quite the way that they should or because they come with strings of cash that I'm not, I can't stand for. And that, I still like it. I still see it as a work. I, can, I understand. It works as a short film. Um, three days to shoot, 20,000 pounds budget. Very, very smart producer, sent it to the right festivals at the right time. Yes. How many crew? Um, be 15 of us. What much was that? Mm -hmm. In total. What do you think you can get away with? Sorry? How many? Could I get away with? The smallest? No, something like that. Or something like that. Couldn't have lost any of them. Oh, really? No, everyone really did. I mean, we brought our own sandwiches in the morning, but it wouldn't have been much fun. 
<laughs> but I mean, it was the budget that we managed to pull together from just one source, Swedish Film Institute. They, uh, they funded it based on the script. And the fact that it was a, a, a young producer at a, a quite established production company who sent it in. And then the fact, I guess the fact that I'd gone to the film school and that they, they liked the script. But um, without that, I don't think I would have got ego finance, really, without the success of that. But I mean, the film you're going to see tonight, then, if you are coming to see ego, is a romantic comedy drama for people who like Twilight. I mean, I love ego with all my heart, but it's not a little indie film like that. So I hope that you'll, with that in mind, come and enjoy it as much as I enjoyed making it, because it's still my baby, and I'll stand for every frame of it till the day I die, I think. Is it four o'clock now? I suppose it must be, right? If you've got, has anyone got any questions? Yes? Yes. Uh, how do you, I, I think I'll be a director, but not thinking of quite, um, quite as as not very assertive. Mm -hmm. Last time I had a directing experience, it went quite for a second. Mm -hmm. I was co-directing with someone. Mm -hmm. Never do that, it's awful. Yeah. Two people, for me it doesn't work. I, I can't even imagine a directing with somebody because unless you have very, very clear boundaries of what's your day and what's their day to be the voice, then it's always going to be a power struggle. Was it a bloke who were directing it as well? Yeah, it was a hard <laughs> It works, I think, when one directs the camera and the way it's going to be shot and the other directs the, the shoulder and queen, what's that called? Per, uh, the, the actors. Mm -hmm. Or that you say, we're going to direct this together, I'm the voice today and you're just my little person to speak to and then you do different days. That <laughs> might work. But I um, just, I've recently pitched on a job that I want so much that I just literally can think of nothing else. It's about a woman who spent 28 years in a California prison for two shootings that her husband did while she was a heroin addicted prostitute. And it's like, you know, the film Monster. It's incredible. Her, her son was killed while she was in prison. I mean, it's just a mad, mad story. And the, the producer said <coughs> it's 40 million, 40 million Swedish pound budget, so that's a really big budget. And uh, would you be pre possibly prepared to co-direct it with like Stella Skarsgård? And I was like, well, A, Stella Skarsgård is an amazing actor, he's not a director. That undermines what a director does if you're going to put somebody who's never directed so much as a short film before with me. I mean, I don't know Stella Skarsgård, how am I going to direct with him? He'd have to move to my house and live with me for a year for me to get a relationship with him that would be tight enough that we would have shared vision. Because it's two visions does not a film make. I don't think that's the same, but I made one up. Don't lose heart, you want a director. If you're a director, if you want to be a director, don't say want to be, say I am a director. All directors have different styles. Even my brother is one of the best directors in the whole wide world. He's an awful person. He's <laughs> drag actors around by their underarm skin and shout at people. He's a demon, for real. If you've ever read any of your books on him, you'll find your way. Just don't lose your confidence. Just trust yourself, trust your vision, and say, if you haven't got a loud voice, say, can everyone please be quiet while I speak? I am the director. You don't have to be Miss A-type personality loud pants to do it. You do it in your way, you are one. <laughs> but, perhaps, I mean, this is, you know, that quite a big budget, uh, or production. But this was a big budget. Well, no, no, I mean, a lot of people were told. I mean, I used to, I used to do a teacher unit, a solo mm -hmm. video unit, for, you know, second years. Mm -hmm. And this is make a three minute film, mm -hmm. I mean, they were quite good. But what was it that down? The person who was acting. I mean, that woman was exceptional. Yeah, she's amazing. I mean, the tight angle, the depth of field, and blah, blah, blah. But obviously, you thought, well, she's always been out of terrible experience yeah, in the yeah, past. Yeah, yeah. And it is quite hard, because I mean, I remember seeing some of these new films. I mean, that, you know, they were filmed like the car, right? Yeah. But they were quite good. But the people who actually were speaking first were. Yeah. Well, so the production value is there, the actor. Yeah, yeah that's why right. I said the importance of casting. You can't polish it up. I mean, that's you give them terrible, <laughs> terrible actors the best director in the world can't make them truthful. And there's been times where I've been working with amazing actors, allegedly amazing, and their performance has been so awful. I've wanted to go, okay, I'm not an actor, but I could actually say that with more belief in myself than you are right now. Obviously, you don't say that because they believe. <laughs> but you've got to find the right actors and a good script. Don't even bother lifting a camera up and shooting something that you know in your heart is pretentious shit. That's sentimental, that's badly written, that's badly observed, that's skinny but coming out of sun, that's in Swedish as well. Writing on the nose, is that even a saying? Mm -hmm. When you write something so bloody obvious, it's just like, mm -hmm. 
subtext, 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 come on. Um, you just need a good script and good actors and then lifting a camera, whether it's your mobile phone camera, it doesn't matter. I've seen films that are so indie that you can barely hear what's going on, but you see from right to the heart what it is that they're <coughs> the story telling and the acting that is, is flawless. So it's just about prioritising. Mm -hmm. um, I did know that you've made and I've shown, shown that film about three times to students and teach. And uh, I, just to shut up, see the scene about this fantastic, fantastic film. Um, but one thing I can ask, every year I show it to the last two or three years of students is, yeah, from the kids. And I just wonder oh, what, yeah. and I don't know the answer. Yeah. <coughs> so I want to ask you, Again, going back to my last answer, you see 90 kids. Yeah. 50 of them, when you say, can you walk across the room angrily, go. You say, can you feel angry and just walk across the street? Can you just imagine you go, oh God. Way. You can't, you speak to them yeah. like they're adults. And you get the ones who aren't show-offs, aren't so quiet that they don't have the will. And have, kids have to have the combination of wanting to do it, and being able to leave themselves alone. If, if you explain it to them like you would with an adult, I want you to do it how you would do it if you were angry. Not acting with a capital A. You're just going to do it if you were really, really upset, you were really, really angry. I just have... The trick is to just treat them like they're grown up. You and the last little speech from Alex. Yeah, he's amazing. He's got a camera actor and that's pretty fun. I know, he's incredible. But he was one out of maybe 60 boys that we yeah. saw, and he had absolutely everything going for him. When I, they, he couldn't, they couldn't really read very well, so you couldn't ask them to remember lines, but they did. And in the audition process, you would say the line and then they would say it back to you. So I said to him, that's not coming, that's not coming back. And he went, that's not coming home. And they just said it again, that's not coming back. And he went, that's a classic, that's a classic. You were like that. And he thought it was a classic line to say, that's not coming home. So uh, I just, there was something about him that was just yeah. quite exceptional. And there's another little bomb boy who was down to the last two, the one who says, my dad's an architect. Yeah. It was between him and the little ginger muffin, and we ended up with him because he just he kept on coming back. Like I said, see them again and again. A kid, particularly, might be good one day, and the next week they might need a Coca-Cola to wake them up, you know what I mean? So, uh, getting good performance about children is not patronising them also helps enormously that I can give them a line reading in English and they just because that Swedish kids learn English. So I can, instead of telling them in Swedish the tonation of it, I can say, look, can you help me? So I have Swedish as a second language. In English, what I want to say is this, and they would hear it, feel the sentiment, but not be told that they were doing it wrong. You've got a minimal time, presumably, you've got that falling off the cliff time with, with them for that, for those setups and things. So yeah. you've got to work quite quickly. Yeah, because kids as well legally can only work successfully. Yeah, of course, but the concentration is off. Yeah, yeah, it dwindles terribly. But also just get the parents on site so they're not lingering yeah. around in the doorway. What we did is for the day when she explained what rapist means, there was no kids in the room. Yeah, um, yeah. And every body that even came to audition, I said, look, we're going to be talking about rapists here, and if the kids suddenly don't work as a rapist, let's all have the same answer and not start bringing sex into it, because they're little, they're six to eight years old, and there's no need. We'll just all together as adults say it's when one adult presses another adult to do something against their will. If we do that, then we undramatise it, but we're still kind of excited when they're going to say what well, it's fun. It's a big word, you know, and it only really needs the power of it in your own language. If someone says the word rapist in French, you don't react. It's, even to me, rapist is so much harsher to my ears than rocket's mum, which I've only owned that word for like nine years since I moved to Sweden. So just get the parents on side, pick kids whose parents aren't in that world as well, one theatre mums, and, treat, and work with the kids as if they were not stupid, if they're not. 